And joining us now is Kamal Nath. He is India's Minister of Road Transport and Highways. And we welcome you to Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It's nice to meet you. Uh, we are going to talk about the purpose of your visit, but I can't help but start with, for a few questions anyway, the welcoming that you got when you gave your speech here. Uh, there were 500 Sikh protesters welcoming you to this city uh, who were protesting your visit here. And I want to just start by getting your reaction to that. What did you think? Well, I was surprised. I had read something in the press, and I was very surprised and uh, uh, appalled by it because uh, uh, they were protesting about uh, incidents in 1984 where I've not been charged uh, in, a, in any court of law, in any police report, and uh, forget about uh, being convicted. I've not even been charged. There's nobody in India uh, who's made a charge at me saying that uh, he in any way was affected by anything what I had done or said. Well, let's just fill in the blanks for those who may not know. The, the suggestion was, certainly the Sikh protesters said that you led a Hindu mob that attacked a Sikh temple, the result of which was that several people were burned inside. That was the allegation anyway. Well, that's an what allegation. That? That's an allegation made yeah. after 20 years. There's no allegation. I was here three years ago. I've been coming to Canada for so many years. I live in India, where these incidents were supposed to happen. Uh, and nobody's ever made that charge for 20 years. Suddenly, somebody pipes up, a group of people claiming to represent the Sikh community, which they don't, uh, start making these charges. Are they false, the charges? I mean, they are false and malicious because uh, here they're talking about incidents in India. Nobody has charged me for 20 years. There were, there were charges made on many others in police stations, in courts. Nobody charged me for 20 years. And suddenly, um, on one visit after three years when this incident happened in 1984 and I've been coming to Canada for so many times. So I, I was surprised that what is the origin of this and what is the purpose of this? Do you know the answers to those questions? Well, uh, it's widely known that these represent the, the elements who uh, uh, have had separatists, who were propagating separatist uh, uh, agendas in the past. And now when that's a non-issue, they've started on this, a human rights issue. So and you... they chose to charge me um, uh, for reasons I couldn't understand when nobody in India has charged me. So do you think they're exploiting your visit for their own political purposes? Absolutely. Uh, having said all that, do you have second thoughts about having come to Canada because of all this? Not at all. I knew this was going to happen. Uh, I'd read all the releases they'd made, the emails they'd sent, and... Uh, that made me even more determined to come. More determined to come. Did you see any of the protesters? No, I didn't. So they kind of snuck you in a back door or something? Yeah, I went in from a side, from an entrance. I don't know which entrance I went in, but I didn't see them. Perhaps they were in the front and I went from the side. Would you have wanted a chance to address the crowd? I don't think so, because these are elements when they know. They're not talking sense, they're not talking logic. And when, you, when you're dealing, you're trying to uh, engage with somebody who themselves, I'm sure, also know it's all false because they do know that I've not been charged. They do know that nobody's come out and said that he's been affected by anything. They do know that they are doing it after 20 years. It's not that they don't know this. So what do you talk to them about? Okay, let's move on. Your current portfolio is the Minister of Road, <coughs> Transport and Highways, and you are overseeing some of the largest capital projects uh, in the, I think this is one of the largest infrastructure renewal projects in the history of the world. It's That's huge. Uh, so before we talk about what you're doing, let's get a sense about where things were at. What is the current state of India's infrastructure in your view? Well, we have a huge infrastructure deficit. Uh, I think the biggest deficit we have in the country now, as we are on a growth trajectory, is to bridge this deficit. And uh, we are trying to catch up. We're not trying to build for the future. Uh, building for the future will be the next step. At the moment, we are so far behind in our entire infrastructure. Uh, that it's an enormous task. Hmm. Here in North America, we feel, I think we're going through a bit of a public transit splurge right now. We feel that the, uh, the automobile has been too favored for too long and we're trying to catch up in public transit. I know China's building a massive high-speed rail network. They're talking about doing similar things in the United States. You guys in India are focusing on roads. How come on roads? Well, because you've got to have connectivity. And roads affects the lives uh, of every single person. Roads impacts industry, uh, agriculture, and trade. Uh, when you talk about education, education 
affects the lives of some people, but roads affects the life of everybody. Okay. In um, Mar March 12th, the Ottawa Citizen, which is one of our larger newspapers in Canada, wrote the following. The road sector in India <coughs> is plagued by poor planning and execution, corruption, and huge time and cost overruns. About 40% of road contracts have cost overruns of 25 to 50%, and about 90 billion rupees are locked up in disputes and arbitration. There is also a shortage of labor. India has 110,000 highway engineers, compared to more than 500,000 in China. Land acquisition is a big challenge, with most tracts of land in India lacking clear title deeds and growing opposition from farmers against use of land for industrial purposes. Can you tell us some of what you're trying to do to deal with all of these problems? Well, to start off with land acquisition, I don't think that's, a, uh, that's very correct because land acquisition in the case of roads is not combative. It's not a contentious issue because it's five meters here and five meters there or 10 meters either way. And people uh, are happy that the value of the land will go up. So I get a lot of requests, in fact, to divert the road uh, through their people's land. So land acquisition uh, has been a delayed process. The process causes delay. <clears throat> it's not contentious or combative. Uh, so that's uh, where okay. I think land is concerned. And what we've addressed that. We've addressed that by changing the process and so on and so forth. What about the corruption issues? Well, I, I see we have a very transparent process. And we have international companies bidding. Much of that, what they talk of, so much locked up in this and uh, so much, uh, there are so many delays, is a story of the past. Uh, is the not corruption the issue is not a story today? I, I don't think so. It's, not big, it's all transparent. So it's all by bids. And when you have a bid, an open bid, a transparent bid, well, that's the way it is. Have you been able to convince the markets that that's the case? Well, the markets are convinced. That's why they're all internationally, all players are coming, because they're convinced. How about engineers? It says you're, you're way low on what you need to engineer and design all these projects. I, well, we have been outsourcing engineering and design to technical consultants. Mm -hmm. And with the huge jack-up we, which we've done of the program, uh, there is a shortage of technical consultants. In fact, this morning I was talking uh, to technical consultants to uh, beef up their capacities, those who work in India, Canadian consultants who work in India, uh, because we've jacked up our program so much. And uh, in the past, there was no shortage. Now when we've jacked it up in the span of eight or 10 months, obviously there's going to be that bang uh, of uh, consultants not having capacity to do it. Okay, here's <clears throat> our largest circulation newspaper in this country is the Toronto Star. And here is what they uh, published earlier in March. Across this sprawling <coughs> country, work crews toil around the clock to meet the government's goal of 20 kilometers worth of new roads built every day over the next four years. It's a mammoth task that is India's largest and highest profile public sector project. While India has had laws banning children, such as 10-year-old Bahara, from working in quarries and in other hazardous occupations, occupations for more than 20 years, children's rights advocates say the government and even international donors such as the World Bank are loath to ensure those laws are enforced, both because child labor is affordably helping India modernize and because the country's education system is in a shambles and couldn't handle the influx of India's estimated 60 million working children. Okay, what is your government doing on this issue of child labor, which obviously the paper suggests is pretty inappropriate? I do not know what the paper suggests, but I do know that India has not been charged with child labor. I've been Commerce and Industries Minister for many years and across the country, across so many countries, this was never a charge. Uh, it's all open. We are an open society. You can't have child labor having, uh, you know, being, uh, having uh, been done secret, uh, secretly. It's all open. So if there's child labor, you will see optics of it, you'll see visuals of it. And if you're suggesting there's child labor and road building, I think uh, it's ridiculous because, because you can't build roads uh, in the dark. You can't build roads behind uh, walls. Roads are open. People would see. And we enforce our child labor laws very strongly. So it is not happening? It's not happening, at least not in road building. And if there are isolated cases, there are isolated cases happening in rural India, or isolated case, cases happening. It's just like something happening illegally. How about subcontracts, which don't necessarily take place in full public view on the roads? But subcontracts take place, and a road is being built in full public view. How can you have a subcontract ha happening secretly? And 
it's a law, whether it's a subcontractor or it's a contractor or a sub sub subcontractor. Mm -hmm. It's the law. No, it's the law, but laws are broken. <clears throat> but you're confident this law is not being broken? Not at all. Not at all. Not at least not in roads. There's no charge. And the World Bank, who engages with me very much, has not ever made this charge of child labor to me. Well, that's it. They're saying the World Bank is loath to ensure the laws are enforced because they understand the stakes here. I don't think uh, it's a concern. Uh, it's really a concern. I think it's just a hype being built up. Not at all. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't buy that at all. Okay. All of this requires, all of your projects obviously require billions and billions of dollars of uh, investment over the next few years. How are <coughs> you financing all of this? Well, 60% is going to be on, are going to be toll roads. 25% are going to be annuities, that is deferred payment, and 15% will be on EPC. We have assessed EPC is uh, peace rate contracts, the general contracting, okay. just 15% of it, uh, which also we are trying to reduce. Now, our funding, our sources of funding is the cess we get from petrol and diesel. There's a cess which is imposed on petrol and diesel, but it's a nominal amount, uh, which is transferred to the road building account. Uh, then there's the funding we get from multilateral agencies like the World Bank or the ADB uh, and so on and so forth from the private sector. Have you got a price tag on the whole thing? Well, when we are talking of 20 kilometers a day, we are talking of 7,000 kilometers a year. And to complete 7,000 kilometers a year, we are talking about uh, uh, having a work in progress of 20,000 kilometers. And 20,000 kilometers is $50 billion. 20,000 kilometers is $50 billion. And this is a multi-year project. Well, we got to do 7,000 kilometers per year. So right. at any given time, you got to have 20,000 kilometers of work in progress. <laughs> uh, are public-private partnerships a part of this as well? Absolutely. How so? Well, the BOT toll is a public-private partnership. In fact, this is the largest public-private partnership ever undertaken. But are, the, are there going to be private sector companies that own the roads at the end of the day? Of course, there they are, are. Okay. and there will be. There are about 100 roads which are owned by private sector companies. And this is accepted? I mean, we've had some experience with this over here, and I think it's fair to say the jury is out on whether or not people like this. There are some people who believe that the state should own all the roads, and that when you allow a private sector company to build and own a road, uh, it is rife for difficulties. Let's just put it that way. People don't, uh, people aren't necessarily thrilled about the, the tolls no. that are charged <clears throat> on those roads, that kind of thing. In India, we have a concession period. And for that concession period, they operate, manage, and toll the road. So it's not an issue as yet. And here, people have a, I, I know about it, I was reading about it. People don't want to pay the toll. Right. And uh, so, in India, it's different. People are seeing a better road, they're saving on fuel, they're saving on time, and they're willing to pay a small amount of what they save uh, on toll. Okay. What are the opportunities for Canadian companies and Canadian investors in all of what you're planning? Well, over the last two days, I, this is what I've discussed, and uh, we are looking at Canadian investments in our concessions. We are looking at Canadian contracting companies, Canadian consulting companies. Uh, to come and participate in this huge program we have. And are the relations between our two countries satisfactory enough that you think there's an opportunity for Canadians to go over there, help out, make some money and so on? They already are making a lot of money. All the Canadian companies in India are making a lot of money. Who's making a lot of money over there? Well, everybody, the entire private sector is. Our, our growth story is a private sector driven growth story. And if there's huge investments coming into India, it's only because they see profits. Part of the reason I ask is, and we'll just finish off in our last few minutes here on the uh, World Trade Organization, because you know that, <coughs> um, well, you were the lead negotiator, weren't you, for India in their um, WTO in the last round? Yes, I was. Yes, okay. So you, you, know, you know better than anybody then about how the so-called Doha round, which started in 2001, and they've been at it almost 10 years now, and they still haven't got signatures on a piece of paper. Why, in your view, has this round, which you know so well from your first-hand experience, why has it not been concluded yet? Well, I think this round was dealing with some of the most difficult aspects. You had the Uruguay round, which set up the WTO. Uh, it dealt with a large number of issues, but it put on the side, uh, it put under the table, uh, issues which were very contentious. And the Doha round is supposed to take up those issues which were left behind, or build upon some of the issues which were dealt with in the past. So the most contentious issues, Issues relating to subsidies, uh, issues relating to market access, uh, issues relating to services, all these issues were left out. 
and that is why this round took on uh, very, very contentious issues. I am trying to remember if it was you that she was talking about. The American special trade negotiator during all of this said, uh, after the talks had broken down between your country and hers, she said, you know, I love you. And it was either you or maybe somebody else who said, you know, if you loved us a little more, we'd have a deal. Yeah. So I'm glad you love us, but you don't love us enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember that because I remember <laughs> was Susan that you Sharp, who said that? Yes, yeah, Susan Sharp telling me I love you. I said, you don't love me enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, if they loved you more, what would happen? Well, I think uh, uh, the position was simple and the uh, differences were uh, sometimes small, sometimes large. Our position was uh, that you, it's free trade and fair trade. You can't just talk about free trade without talking about fair trade. And if the United States subsidizes its agricultural products and then wants market access into India of those agricultural products, that's not competition. The Indian farmer will be competing with the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. government, not with the U.S. farmer. Everybody subsidizes their farmers though, right? No. Not everybody? No. Darn near everybody. Well, I don't know whether Canada does. Canada claims it doesn't. Uh, and if you're saying Canada does, well, we have another point then. My, <laughs> no, my, my understanding was that everybody subsidizes their farmers, the EU especially, the Americans especially. Yeah, the EU subsidizes yeah. it, but EU is, are not aggressive exporters. It's I the see. United States who subsidize it, there's one part of it, and then having subsidized them, want those farmers to export to, uh, to developing country markets. Do you think your country, though, bears any responsibility for the lack of a finished product in the Doha round? Well, I don't know. Uh, some say we have responsibility, some say we don't. But What do you uh, say? I s certainly not, because all I said was, and I still say, that we must have a fair deal. And you cannot, you cannot say that we are going to subsidize and we want market access. Uh, we have to take into account the disparities between, in, between developing countries and developed countries. Uh, so no deal is better than a bad deal, obviously. Well, yes, and the most important thing is the developed countries must ensure that the developing countries have healthy economies because then only they are markets. Today, if India is not a healthy economy, we won't be able to buy all the wheat we buy from Canada or all the beans and the lentils we buy from <laughs> Canada or all the other things we buy from Canada. Which are the best in the world, of course. Well, they're the cheapest. That's why we buy them. <laughs> but, uh, but if we were a sick economy, we couldn't have done anything of that. Right. So, you know, I think developed countries have really a vested interest in seeing healthy economies in developing countries. Sure. Um, I think I've seen in numerous newspaper articles where you have been described as kind of the champion of the developing world in these negotiations. Why do you think the developing world needs a champion? Well, we had a coalition. We, were, we had set up coalitions of various disparate interests, not common interests, like the G20. We had the G33, which was agricultural sensitivities, groups with agricultural sensitivities, and we were all together in it. And I think India, because uh, of its size, um, uh, was playing a role in it. Do you think there's going to be a deal soon? Well, I don't know whether... Uh, I've not followed it closely now, but I don't think uh, uh, many of the countries are ready for it. The differences are still too big. Differences are too big, and I think ever since the breakdown, uh, there has been no real serious attempts to converge. Okay. Minister, it's good of you to join us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much for visiting us. Thank you.